provide bread for these people to eat. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the back of the truck, 
It could have been a miracle. There was enough food for everyone. Now maybe it shocks you if I suggest these two versions are actually the same story. In one case, we're imagining people much like ourselves, affluent suburban North Americans with the luxury of cupcakes and backyard picnics. In another, we're a world away where malnourished villagers have barely enough to feed their children. What do these stories have in common? Enough. They have enough in common. The concept of enough. And the difficulty we humans have in believing in it. In both stories, there's the same assumption of scarcity. Push your way to the front of the line. Grab that cupcake before your brother gets it. Do what you have to do to get your share, because there certainly is not enough to go around. Or is there? In the gospel for today, we have a very familiar story, the miracle feeding of 5,000 people. In John's version, which we heard this morning, Jesus tests the disciples and asks Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Ignoring the chance of a nice walk to the village bakery, Andrew points out that there's a boy with five barley loaves and two fish. But then, doubting himself, he goes on to ask, but what are they among so many people? In the other versions of the story, the disciples' anxiety is more obvious as they comment on the scarcity of what is at hand. In John's version, they step back and they let Jesus do his work, keeping their worries to themselves. But in every version of this story, the same miraculous outcome these apparently minimal supplies are brought to Jesus for his blessing and distributed to the crowd. Everyone is fed. Everyone is satisfied. With 12 baskets of leftovers, miracle of miracles, there was enough after all. So what really happened in this story? There were scores of commentaries and interpretations of this famous miracle. And yes, it is most often called a miracle in our Christian tradition. Did Jesus take the loaves and the fishes and multiply them so that there were enough to feed 5,000 people? That's one explanation. Did his blessing over the loaves and the fishes create such grief, grace in the people present that they opened their hearts and their lunch boxes, sharing what they themselves had already brought along? That's another explanation. In fact, it really doesn't matter. Either way, it is a miracle over nature or over human nature. Either way, it's a reminder that in God's kingdom, there is always enough to go around. And when God's people finally open their hearts, there will be plenty of whatever is needed. Now, we spend a good deal of our energy as Christians praying for the hungry, and I am proud of the ways that we here at Trinity help those who lack the most basic areas of human need. Next week, as they do it every month, our youth will gather in our kitchen at 9 o'clock to prepare meals for the shelter in Upper Darby. And this afternoon, as in every Sunday afternoon in the summer, one of our members will be collecting the vegetables donated from local gardens and there's some really big ones out there. I just checked the cucumbers at this day. And they'll drive them down to Chester. Today, as every Sunday, many of you brought food to be offered at the altar before it is carried down to St. Mary's food cupboard. These are all very good works, important ministries, and reminders that what most world food experts tell us is true. There is enough, indeed enough, to feed the world only we would distribute it fairly. But today's lesson is really not about food, is it? Oh yes, all three of the stories that I just told happen to be about food, but let's not be too literal here. Our assumption of scarcity is not limited to food or even to material things, any more than Jesus' feeding is limited to the hungers of the body. If we are honest, we will acknowledge that our lack of vision extends beyond our bodily needs. In our own affluent, overfed culture, it is our time and our energy, 
about which we are most greedy, isn't it? There never seems to be enough of either one. We parcel out our time in greedy increments. We are hesitant to share. What if we run out by the end of the day? What if we spend it on the wrong people and then find we don't have enough left over for what will really make us happy? Food, money, time, emotional energy, a fear of scarcity seems to run our lives. It undergirds our busyness, our noisiness, our addictions. Whatever we have, we can never relax and trust that it will be enough. The real power of this morning's gospel for busy, anxious people like ourselves is its message of enough, even abundance. It is a message that flies against the common wisdom of our culture and against human nature. Time and again, in words and in actions, Jesus reminds us there's no need to worry. In today's gospel, he even walks across the water to prove his point. Don't be afraid, he keeps saying to his disciples. It's his most common quotation in all of the gospel narratives. Seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you. Do not be anxious about tomorrow, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or what clothing you shall wear. Again and again, Jesus tells us, don't worry. And in today's story, he models this radical trust by taking what was in hand, five small loaves and two skinny little fish and blessing them in their sufficiency. It was enough. And what about us? Is it enough, my friends? Can we replicate this miracle in our own lives? Yes, we are a hungry people, anxious and afraid and burdened by responsibilities, well-fed beyond what's healthy, yet always hungry. Blessed with so much, yet always anxious that it will be taken away. But remember, we are also disciples of Jesus and gifted with front row seats to the miracle of his grace every single day. Are we bold enough to receive that miracle? To take what he's given us and pass it with open hearts to our children, to the needy and the lonely in our community. Pass it to one another. This is not an old-timey story of lunch on a hillside. No, it's a present tense adventure of radical trust in God. We have enough for ourselves and an abundance to give away. If we can learn to believe in this, if we can surrender to the plenitude that flows from God's hand, if we can cultivate contentment, if we can look at our lives and see not what is lacking, but the fullness that is already there. Now that would be a miracle indeed. Amen.